Um, welcome to you all to this meeting of the Black Country Society Virtual Heritage Group. Uh, those of you who don't know me, I'm Chris Baker. I'm one of the conveners of the group. Uh, we've been running almost a year now, uh, so I suspect many of you probably have seen rather too much of me uh, rather than not knowing me. Um, the group was set up uh, basically to give uh, something for those members of the society and for others who live somewhere away from the black country uh, as many folk do uh, but also there'll be lots of people who actually live in the black country uh, some here i know uh, who would prefer not to go out on dark winter's evenings especially cold ones um, to give us a bit of an idea of where we're all from i wonder if if you'd like to could you put into the chat function please just where you're from the uh, the location of where you are. Um, I'll start off. I am currently nowhere near the Black Country. I'm in uh, Oakham in Rutland, um, and my co um, co-workers um, are uh, Walt Jones, who will be doing the chat afterwards, um, and he. Um, he is actually in um, Chippenham um, and Jeff, who will be giving the talk, is in Chester and we're getting things coming through now. Uh, Shrewsbury, Kenilworth, oh, King Swinford, Northampton, Willanor, uh, Cannock, that's George who's recording, uh, Birmingham, um, Birmingham, I'm not sure someone in Birmingham ought to be allowed onto a black country society uh podcast a black country society meeting um but you can see that we're we're from um chris chris brown uh i'm embarrassed by saying i was at school with her she sent her greetings from northumberland uh starbridge starbridge conway uh kidderminster rochester uh tiptonian living in highly calgary alberta but currently avoiding minus 49 degrees centigrade temperatures in Spain. I'm not sure whether that means, John, you're actually in Calgary or whether you're in Spain. I'm not quite sure. Uh, Malvern, King Swinford, Zomerset with Zeds, and Newent, Gloucester, uh, and though it goes on, St. Ives, Cambridge, originally Sedgley. Um, so you can see we're well scattered. So welcome to you all. It's good to have you. Uh, the form this evening is going to take is perfectly normal. I'm going to introduce the speaker in a moment and then hand over to him. Um, he is perfectly happy to answer questions. If you've got any questions, it would be good if you could put it in the chat chat box, please, that some of you have just been using. And you can do that at any point in the talk. And then when the talk is over and Jeff was telling me it should be about 50 minutes, um, uh, then Ward will put those questions to Jeff. Um, during the uh, meeting, could I ask that you keep your microphones on mute, please? Uh, as we were preparing, Jeff was telling us uh, that he gave a similar presentation uh, when he suddenly heard uh, someone's phone ring and a lady answered saying, I can't talk now, there's some bloke talking about boat building and it's really boring. Um, so it'd probably be best if we didn't hear that sort of thing, I think. Um, at the end of the meeting um we'll go for those who want to and i suspect most of you won't but we'll we'll break out into small groups we'll go into a couple of uh breakout groups maybe five people in each something like that is what it usually is uh and you can then just turn on your video and just chat to each other about how good the talk was how awful the uh, chairman was and that sort of thing but just for about 10 minutes before we bring it to a close but some folk like doing that i know um so uh, again welcome to you all and i'd like particularly to welcome our speaker uh, our speaker jeff um was in his um professional life a retired deputy head teacher of a cheshire high school and he taught physics and maths and therefore by definition is a good bloke um, uh, prior to graduation and training he started his working life in the steel industry 
which I guess I did too, but it was only nine months between school and university, so it hardly counts. Um, his hobbies and interests, he's a vice president of the Cheshire Scouts, he's involved in community work, he's an education volunteer at Chester Cathedral, uh, director of the Chester Ch Canal Heritage Trust, and he's into researching family history. In 2017, uh, he was awarded the British Empire Medal for services to the Scouts and to the community in Cheshire. He's going to talk to us tonight about two centuries of boat building. So, Jeff, uh, could I ask you to unmute yourself if you haven't already done so uh, and share screen as you wish to. Thank you very much, Chris. Well, good evening, everyone. And it, it really is a pleasure to be here. And I think I'll start with my aims and objectives. The simple aim is to share the story of uh, two boat building brothers, my uh, forebears, who spread their wings for whatever reason, and I'll discuss that briefly during the talk, and established what I think can safely be said as celebrated boat yards, one in Canada and one here in Chester. Um, and basically that's it. Uh, and the story does go back effectively two centuries. The, the main protagonist will be my grandfather, Harry Taylor, up there, J.H. Taylor in Chester, and my great uncle, Jim, J.J. Taylor, James Jesse Taylor, who went to Canada. So who, who was it? Who, where, where did it all begin? Well, it was in Dudley, Tipton, Darleston and Walsall. One of my features of my hobby has been family history. And I'm so fortunate to actually have a great oral history. An awful lot of, of the information I'm sharing with you all this evening is oral and anecdotes that I've picked up over years. I suppose I'm fortunate that my father, Horace, was born in 1899. So I've got that vast sort of oral history that my dad had. Uh, that's what I'll be sharing with you today. So, OK, we start with my two times great grandfather, James Taylor. He was a boat builder born about 1809. And I'll talk a little bit about the problems of when was he born. He married Elizabeth Billingham from Quarry Bank and the Billinghams were chain makers. Um, and they had a rook of children. But the important child in this case was Joseph Taylor, my great grandfather. He married Mary Patrick. Uh, the Patricks were tailors, in, which is awfully complicated, isn't it? A tailor marrying a tailor. Where, uh, they were in Rowley Regis. And they had themselves 12 children, of which Joseph Harry Taylor, Harry, my grandfather, for simplicity, James Jesse Taylor, JJ, my great uncle, and Frank George, my uncle Frank. Frank George... Uncle Frank is the one uncle I do remember because he didn't die until 1957. So I'll be sharing their stories with you. Well, James and Elizabeth, my two times great grandparents, were married at St. Thomas's Church, which I didn't realize was high, is, I've highlighted it, but features in this Turner engraving from 1835 of Dudley. Uh, Interestingly enough, I bought the print in Bermuda, but that things from the West Midlands and the Black Country turn up all over the place. And I love that statement of Dickens, where he described it as a cheerless region in which tall chimneys crowded in on each other, presenting that endless repetition of the same dull, ugly form and poured out plagues of smoke, obscured the light and made foul the melancholy air. I get a feeling Dickens wasn't very keen on Dudley. Mind you, he also had a jaundiced view of Stafford, if you read some of Dickens' comments. Well, James and Elizabeth had actually other children that were not boat builders, although they had one son, James Taylor. He was a boat builder, born 1836 in Leicestershire. That is according to the 1851 census. Uh, they also had a daughter, and Matilda Taylor. She was a shopkeeper. They also, of course, had my great-grandfather, Joseph Taylor, um, who was the boat builder, and I'll be following his story through, and Jesse Taylor, who sadly, my, my two times great uncle, was actually an inmate in Walsall, in the um, uh, Wolverhampton... Uh, 
what was it? The um, Union Workhouse. And for some reason, Chris, ah, we're moving on. So a little bit of background about the other children. My great, great uncle, James Taylor, as I said, was a boat builder, born 1836 in Leicestershire. I have him recorded in 1851 census as a boat builder at the age of 15. And frankly, in family history terms, I've drawn, a, a, I've come against a brick wall. I can find no more details about my great, great uncle, James Taylor, but he was a boat builder and is listed as a boat builder in 1851. And Matilda, I've followed her story through and I'm in touch with her descendants. She was a shopkeeper. She married a William Sanders, who was a circular sawyer from Longton in Staffs. And they kept a grocer's shop at 10 Pearson Lane, Wolverhampton. And then sadly, Jesse, my great great uncle, who was an inmate in the Union Workhouse in Wolverhampton, he's buried in Merrydale Cemetery. So at least I've given some recognition to the people who did not become full-time boat builders. Now, my great granddad, James Taylor, he was a boat builder. I think he was somewhat enigmatic. He seemed to be restless moving about the place and the census returns track his movements. 1851, I find him in Dudley, on Dudley level. 1861, Rowley Regis. 1871, in Darleston. So clearly over a period of 20 years, he's moving around. Is he following the work? Always the residences are alongside the canal. He actually died um, in and, and uh, his death in 1879. And then the enigma is that his death certificate had to have a statutory declaration made to correct his age was from 70 to 65. So I asked the question, was he born in 1809 or 1814? I'm quite puzzled why my great great grandfather actually had to change his uh, date of birth or at least give a false date of birth. More substantive information now about Joseph Taylor, my great grandfather. He was certainly a boat builder. Question is, was he a businessman? Let's see. The 1871 census shows him actually living in Herbert's Park, Darleston. That's now known as George Rose Park. And I'd love to think, was this the location in Herbert's Park colliery of that boatyard? That's the tithe apportionments from the genealogist. That little indent into Herbert's Park could be a boat dock. Romantically, I like to think that's where the boat dock was. In 1974, I recorded my father, shown there on the left, Horace, talking to his sister, my auntie Edna, and they were reminiscing about the stories they'd heard of their grandfather, my great-grandfather, Joseph Taylor. My dad recounted, Herbert's Park was a mud bank with one or two slipways. And while he, that is, his granddad, my great-granddad, was running the business, he often left the family and would take off with his fiddle and visit the local pubs and generally binge. My auntie Edna replied, he smoked a clay pipe and went playing the fiddle round the pubs. My dad said he used to talk to the local ironmasters. He could build coal boats for them. He could talk with the high as well as the low. He was a businessman when he was off the drink. And when they talk about a boat yard or a mud bank, I love this constable picture of uh, the Flatford Mill, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with, showing how boats were built on mud banks effectively. We didn't have grand slipways and boat yards, just a mud bank. The family story, though, goes on to say that they lived in an upturned narrowboat on this mud bank, maybe similar to Peggotty's cottage pictured in David Copperfield, the Hablet Night Brown, the fizz illustrations, although it is possible that the boat wasn't upside down, it was the right way up and just perhaps on stilts to give a bit more headroom. 
But great granddad Joseph built coal boats at Herbert's Park. We call them in the trade Joey boats. They were 40 feet long <coughs> and carried coal. A lot of the coal was brought down from Cannock Chase and then taken down into Wolverhampton, Walsall, and possibly down into Birmingham. They would often carry back manure. Um, and I used to worry a little bit about what they meant by manure, but what they meant was slate lime. They would carry slate lime back to dress the fields up in Cannock and beyond. They also built skiffs, rowing boats. What has come to light to me is that the canals at the time of the Industrial Revolution, as it were, were used as leisure facilities as well. People did row, they did fish, they did even have steamers on the canal, as we will see. Well, financial difficulties for granddad, great granddad, I, possibly. We see in the Birmingham Daily Post, 1874, wood boats for sale, elm bottom, oak bottom strake, six months old, applied Joseph Taylor and Co, boat dock, Bilston. Now, just to mention, they used green elm for the bottom of boats. That is elm that wasn't seasoned. When it was still green, i.e. fairly freshly cut from a felled tree, it was quite impervious. It didn't rot and decay as seasoned woods would. And the bottom strake refers to the bottom plank that's next to the uh, elm bottom that was made of oak. However, a few months later, he's selling off pleasure boats. I'm assuming these were skiffs or rowing boats. Four pleasure boats for sale, cheap, built this year. Joseph Taylor, boat builder, Herbert's Park, Bilston. However, what caught my eye was the advert below, prison picked oakum. Boat builders, four tons of prison picked oakum for sale. Now, prisoners were put to picking oakum, as were the inmates of workhouses. In fact, I was told that pickpockets were often given the job of picking oakum because it wrecked their fingers, frankly, and they wouldn't pick many pickpockets after they'd been picking oakum day in, day out. I, I read that a man would was expected to pick about two pounds of oakum, and oakum was used for sealing the seams of the boats, which I will come back to later on. But 1877, great granddad's declared bankrupt. At that point, then, the business was taken over by my grandfather, Harry. And you can see that there's his administration. He died at 31 Green Lane in 1889, and he was buried alongside his wife, that's Mary Patrick, in Rolling Mill Cemetery. I think that's also called Queen Street Cemetery. I think I've heard it called Sister Dora's Cemetery as well, if the plaque's anything to go by. I naively went looking for the grave many years ago, but it, it was almost a deserted, derelict cemetery. Whether it's still in that same state now, I don't know. What is interesting is that he left £147.17 shillings. And last week I put that into the Bank of England inflation calculator and he left quite a reasonable sum of about £16,000, it would appear. But that left my grandfather, Joseph, who inherited the, uh, uh, the business and was also administrator of his, will, his father's will, it left him running the boatyard and looking after his younger siblings. He had at least six siblings under the age of uh, 13. And Uncle Frank, my Uncle Frank, was the younger brother and he was only five years of age. So Uncle Frank was placed in the Royal Orphanage in Wolverhampton. And, you know, I've got this delightful photograph of Uncle Frank when he was about 10. He stayed in the orphanage until 13 and then returned to live and work alongside his elder brother, Harry. He was a delightful uncle. I'm now going to refer to my granddad's brother, my great uncle, JJ, James Jesse Taylor. He was the one who moved to Canada. Well, he married a lady by the name of Ada Cook in 1897 at St Andrew's Church, Walsall, cheek by jowl, I see, with the Walsall Canal. He was also a, a full-time member of uh, St Andrew's Church, and I even have his hymn book at home with his signature in James Taylor, 
June 24th, 1892. But 1904, he left the business that he was in league with, with my grandfather, Harry, and went off to Canada. What I find interesting is that he left the family behind. He went on his own, along with two guys, John Allsop and Fred Allsop. What I found interesting was that JJ had £25 in cash, the equivalent of about £2,500 now, that Allsop brothers had £4, which is about, again, £400 in cash today. That's a lot of cash to be taking to Canada and having in your pocket when he's sharing a business with his brother. But off he goes to Canada. Well, he got to Canada and crammed a great deal into his first two years without his family. He travelled to North Ontar Northern Ontario and worked on boat building on the shores of Lake Tamiskaming. There you can see Lake Tamiskaming, just north of Toronto. It's an enlargement of the Ottawa River. And that and grand, great uncle Jim, JJ, settled in a town of Cobalt. Cobalt was a big mining area and it was a source of silver fields. In fact, cobalt produced nine, at that time, produced about 9% of the world's silver, i.e. the ore. So it was a great, great rich area for gold, silver, copper and nickel. And there was a demand for boats to take the, the oars down the uh, Ottawa River, down to Montreal. So JJ was in the right place at the right time. He had, was a boat builder. And the sort of boats that they were building or using up at Cobalt on the lakeside pictured here would have been right up his street. He would be quite familiar with boat, building that sort of boat for carrying ore down the Ottawa River. However, just as he arrived and got settled in to Cobalt um, and, and let New Liscard in that area, the Tamiskaming and Northern Ontario Railway arrived and um, immediately scuppered, mixed metaphor, the need for boats. The oars could be taken down to Montreal and onward journeys much more quicker, quickly and efficiently by train. So he left and returned down towards Toronto. And at the same time, his wife and family moved into a house in Niagara Street, Toronto. They came out in 1906. There's his wife, Ada, with three sons, William, John and Ron, Ronald. But also what was interesting is Miss, Mrs. M. Allsop and her son, Fred, came out. So there was clearly a link between the Taylors and the Allsops, something that one day I might try and explore. And it's arguable that Niagara Street was an area not so different than what he was familiar with in Darlston. Darlston 1900, Niagara Street in Toronto was very, very similar in, in buildings with artisan dwellings and what have we. So he would, it wasn't the Toronto that we see today. I mean, we think of Toronto with its CN Tower and all that. Some of you may remember about 50 years ago now, Peter Ustinov described Toronto as New York run by the Swiss. Um, and it is a delightful place now. But then when JJ went, was still very much under development. The 1911 census shows JJ already established in Niagara Street, Toronto, and they have a daughter born, Ada Dorothy. Dorothy is one of his daughters I remember and have met several times. She actually insulted me when she was last over here uh, in Chester. Uh, she's now sadly died about 20 years ago, but she said, you built grubby little boats over there in the UK. Well, we didn't build grubby little boats. We built boats that were fit for the purpose. If you're going to carry coal, you don't have a varnished yacht. Uh, I was quite incensed by that comment. JJ spent quite a lot of time, though, as he came down with local companies like Showfield Holdren, and they were based in Toronto. Carl Orr Avenue is in Toronto, and they were building classic launches for the Musco Muskoka playgrounds where rich Americans and Canadians, they had their cottages and they had speedboats and launches. Uh, they had a whale of a time there. So JJ was now honing his skills, building fine boats, as well as 
functional boats, like the narrow boats and skiffs that we had in the UK. He moved with his family to a place called Knox Avenue on the edge of Ashbridge's Bay. And you can see there the, the waterfront of Toronto. Good move because he built boats in his backyard. He didn't have a boat yard. They were just built at the back of Knox Avenue. And there's a photograph of JJ's backyard building what seems to be there quite a fine launch uh, with some other vessels to the right of the picture. He got a contract to build wooden floats for float planes in World War I. And working on these float planes and making the floats gave him a sort of networking facility, he started to meet people who, and so on and build up a reputation. And eventually it gave him contacts and he bought ex-World War I Liberty aircraft engines. They were about 400 horsepower apiece. And thanks to that experience in Muskoka and coupled with his craftsmanship, his reputation spread, not least because he fitted these engines into speedboats to launches. And he was using his stock of Liberty engines. And that culminated in about uh, 1919 when he built the unbeaten Canadian displacement champion that was between 1919 and 1920 called Heldina II. That really did establish his reputation. I'm pleased to say that Heldina II is still floating has been, and has been restored the fastest displacement boat at that time. With all this growing business, JJ built a fairly modest yard in Toronto in about 1920. But the growth was quite rapid. And what did help was prohibition, the demon drink. As you may know, it was not illegal to distill in Canada, but it was Definitely illegal to sell liquor in the States where there was prohibition. JJ used his uh, Liberty engines and speedboats to great effect because there was a need to actually move liquor from Windsor in Ontario across to Detroit in Michigan uh, over that narrow strait on the Detroit River. And one of JJ's sons described the scene. He said, if you hung around the yard, JJ Taylor and sons, you're likely to see a lot of tight fitting, double breasted suits, wide brim fedoras and big cigars in marked contrast to the usual scruffy yachting types. JJ's daughter, Dorothy, when she stopped insulting us with grubby little boats, actually told me that prohibition was a great time for the Taylor family in Canada. And there you can see some liquor being loaded in from a, a train into a speedboat there. JJ built one speedboat with three Liberty engines installed that could really motor. And it also had a, a sort of iron protective guard at the back of the cockpit, presumably to stop the machine gun bullets. His younger brother, Uncle Frank, followed on his heels and went out to Canada to help with the ever-growing business. Frank was born in 1885. And whenever he went to Canada, he went a few times, he never travelled light. There, he's actually based in Chester before he moved across there, went to Liverpool to get the boat. He took his parallel bars with him. He was a great weight trainer and physical exercise man. Uh, I'm not sure whether that is a 200 pound weight, but he certainly took all that clobber with him across the Atlantic and then brought it back. Um, in fact, I still have Uncle Frank's Lignum Vitae Indian clubs, not that I can use them to great effect. Um, I also noticed trivia in my photographs. There's his bicycle with a nice acetylene lamp at the front. Back to Toronto, Uncle Frank with three of his sons, JJ's sons. And in Toronto, JJ developed a range of cabin cruisers. The Challenger series were very popular. They were sort of semi-bespoke. You could have a Challenger launch that was either 30 foot, 35 foot long, 40 feet or 45 foot. They just put different molds in to stretch 
The Boat. It was a very, very popular series. And again, funded on the back of the prohibition. And so JJ's yard grew and grew and grew. He was building yachts, self-writing lifeboats, a wide, wide range of vessels in Canada. And it culminated in the construction of fair miles. He actually constructed 10% of the Royal Canadian Navy's fair miles. Now, the fair miles were actually a, a designed by Noel Macklin in Fairmile in Cobham in Surrey in 1939. Um, Macklin's also celebrated for Eric Campbell, Silver Hawk and Railton cars. But the Fairmiles were prefabricated in, but nevertheless, they all, all these prefabricated bits had to be put together. And JJ built, as I say, 10%. He built eight out of 80 um, of the Royal Canadian Fairmiles. And he had quite a workforce, as you can see there, with at least we can see three fair miles at Taylor's Dock. JJ died in 1945. He actually succumbed to pneumonia. And the business control was continued under family control until the mid-1970s. The reason none of the family or the boys took on, because firstly, by then, his sons were in their late 60s, early 70s, and uh, they couldn't diversify. They were, they were traditional wooden boat builders. And so my granddad, Harry, he was the eldest of the family. But don't forget, there were nine other siblings beside Harry, JJ and Frank. And I'll concentrate on Harry in his Victoria boat dock in Walsall. When I'm stuck at just before Junction 10 on the M6, I, I, I get that feeling that I'm not far from Reedswood Park. I don't think I am, actually. Granddad married his, my grandma, Mary Bailey, and they had three surviving children. My uncle Wilf, who was a boat builder, my dad Horace, who was a boat builder, my auntie Edna, who was not a boat builder, but actually kept the family books and eventually became a director of Taylor's Boatyard when we became a limited liability company. But 1901 sees my granddad not listed as a boat builder, but a beer housekeeper. And that was the victory in the beer house at uh, Reedswood Park. Also, Family legend has it that Grandad also helped scene paint at the Alexander Theatre in Walsall. And thanks to uh, Matthew Lloyd for allowing me to use his photograph here. Um, he certainly was an accomplished sign writer and paint, scene painter, uh, my Grandad Harry. And I find the family recorded in local books like the Walsall Red Book. That's my great granddad, Joseph Taylor, and then my granddad, Harry, in 1896 and in 1900. And of course, there's the Victory Pub. And he kept the steamers and skiffs on the edge of Reedswood Park. And some of you will remember Burt Wood's account of the Victory last year in the miscellany of Black Country Memories. But again, it surprises me in a way that the canals were used for leisure. There's Grandad Harry in a skiff on the Anson branch. And again, we were building joey boats, coal boats, 40 feet long, and regular narrow boats, 70 feet long. Of course, these were powered by horse at that time. And then it was a case of all change. As I say, Jesse went to Canada in 1904 and Grandad moved to Gaboin and on to Chester in 1902, 1903, thereabouts. But there's a bit of a cloud over the family because just as JJ, Grandad's brother, went to Canada, leaving the family behind for a while, Harry, my granddad, left the family in Walsall and moved to Gaboin. Now, again, I'm only repeating family stories. The anecdotes tell that in the pub, there was a problem with the tontine. 
I don't know if you're familiar with Tontine's, a method of raising capital, and you pay into a common pot, a common pool, and you receive interest. That's fine. But when someone dies, the proceeds are then divvied up amongst the surviving members. So the surviving investors benefit from the deaths of their fellow members. And the one who gets the jackpot is the one who survives them all. Uh, a slight, I don't think they, they're actually something I would want to invest in in a ton time. But there was a problem with the money. And we do know from family stories that the police were said to be keeping a keen eye on the victory and the family in anticipation of granddad's return. He never did. He stayed up in Gaboin and then moved to Chester. And I find him again in 1911, actually uh, working at Welsh Frankton with a man called Henry Edgerton. He and this man, Henry Edgerton, started a boat dock at a place called Morton. It's actually on the A5 uh, coming up from Oswestry Street to Chester. It's a delightful area. And I, be I believe that the boat dock was in this area at that time. The contemporary photograph shows the boat dock at Morton. Also, there you can see Grandad painting. He was quite a good portrait painter with my Uncle Wilf, my dad Horace, my Auntie Edna, my grandma. And this is actually Grandad painting his brother-in-law, Joseph Bailey, who was a brown saddler from Walsall. And so we moved to Chester and we settled in Chester. This is where the Shropshire Union Rail Canal runs into the River Dee through what's known in Chester as the River Lock. And so the yard was established. The 1911 map, the main map there, shows the location of the Dee Basin and where the yard was established. And this map actually is roughly as you would see it today. Um, what is now Taylor's Boat Yard is here, which used to be the Shropshire Union Railway and Canal Boat Building Yard. Um, everything else is as is, except the Dee Basin is now a navigable channel running into the River Dee. I'll only mention 1795. That was very significant locally because that's when Ellesmere Port was literally born because the, canal, the Chester Canal linked, El, then in 1795, linked Ellesmere in Salop with a place called Netherpool on the banks of the River Mersey. And that area became known as the Port of Ellesmere. Ellesmere Port was born 1795. We had all sorts of commissions. We didn't build a lot of large boats in the D Basin. Um, for example, we would be commissioned to repair steamers like this, a Griffiths steamer alongside a Shropshire Union butty, a butty being a boat that's pulled by a horse. Um, Griffiths were the largest corn merchants in Chester. And I've got my dad there leaning on the funnel and granddad looking on down alongside. And we had a boatyard. Well, we had a mud bank, a slipway. We established the D Basin Slipway. Granad bought an old steam launch off a gentleman on the river and used it to great effect. He used the steam engine to run a bandsaw. He used steam from the steam engine to run the steam box because to, to actually bend timbers and planks to fit a boat, they have to be steamed an hour for every inch of thickness in the steam box. He put a tarpaulin over the office, or over the cabin, and that made the office, where later on, as a young teenage girl, my Auntie Edna kept the books, a mud bank. But look what's happened. Between about 1911 and 1914, we'd moved to fancy boatyards. In fact, we received a World War subsidy for transport. And so we were able to build purpose-built sheds. And there's a Cheshire farmer's dumb barge called Genie. A dumb barge is one which is towed. It's got no motive power. So World War I brought money into the family. Uncle Frank came back to Chester to help out. And there's a lovely photograph of my dad, Horace, my granddad, and they're doing the corking. They've got lignum vitae corking mallets. My dad's got a corking chisel. 
And this young man's got a tar brush to go over the seams. And this is where oakum, this sort of teased out rope, is tamped into the seams of the boats to help seal them. I mentioned that prisoners and people in workhouses were put to picking oakum. A few pho couple of photographs here. Some lovely corking tools illustrated top left. And corking tools were also found on the Mary Rose. In the D Basin, we built, we were not only commissioned to repair boats, we built a lots of skiffs, rowing boats. Skiffs for the River D. In the background there, you can see Shropshire Union Railway and Canal Company butties and the stables where the horses were stabled. We built a range of small day boats. But 1921 saw the shops union cease carrying. They stopped carrying. And there was this, the World War I government subsidy was stopped in 1920. And 200 workmen locally was thrown out of work. The yard was redundant, the shops union yard. So tailors moved from the D Basin about, what, 500 yards to a new yard that you can see in the background here. This is a wonderful photograph of Shops Union flats stretched across the canal with a butty being towed by a horse coming past. And that's the yard as it is today. We have two 90 foot bays and a graving dock and a shed which is called a flat shed. Well, a, a flat is a boat which is on the canal, it is uh, 70 feet long, 14 feet wide, and carries goods in its hold. Barely two years after they moved to the new yard, my granddad Harry died at the age of 58, and the business was carried on by my uncle Wilf and my dad Horace. The problem was that there was no boat building. The shops union had nearly 600 boats surplus. They ceased carrying. What we were engaged in was relivering the boats. And sometimes a new companies were set up as well. For example, the Midland and Coast Carrying Company was established in Wolverhampton and carried manufacturing good, manufactured goods from the Midlands to Liverpool. In fact, Noah Hingley's output, for example, was exported mainly via Liverpool and was carried there by canal. So we were engaged in maintaining some of the Midland and Coast vessels. Here is the Co Midland and Coast tug energy in the graving dock at Chester's at the Taylor's boatyard. It had what was called a gill patent shrouded propeller. And Mr. Gill was a, a, an engineer actually from Norfolk, but he had worldwide patents. Effectively, the shrouded propeller was to make the propeller more efficient. the graving dock. And if anyone's wondering why we call it a graving dock, the gray, verb to grave means to scratch and to scrape. And so it was basically where boats had their bottoms scraped and scratched uh, in a graving dock, effectively a dry dock, but nevertheless, it was mainly for repairing and, and maintaining boats. And again, I say no work, great work in building boats, but relivering. And this is some of my exact, this particular example is my father's sign writing. I've still got all my dad's sign writing gear, the mall stick and his brushes and so on. But I'm afraid painting to me is limited to ceilings and walls and certainly not sign writing. All examples of dad and granddad's work. My uncle Wilf was not such a good sign writer. But we built yachts, small day boats for the River Dee. And then we got some other commissions to build. The Wolverhampton Corrugated Iron Company moved to Ellesmere Port in 1905. As I say there, it was a strategic position for exporting and importing materials such as steel bars from Belgium and South Wales. And we com were commissioned to construct two floats Right, 
there are two types of boat that I'm going to refer to. A flat, which I've already mentioned, is 70 feet long by 14 feet wide and has a hold. The, the cargo is placed inside the vessel. A float is 70 feet long, 14 feet wide, but has a flat deck, which gets terribly confusing. So a float has got a flat deck, a flat hasn't got a flat deck. And this is one of the floats we were building for the Wolverhampton Corrugated Iron Company. Notice elm bottom, green elm. And the planks, this is the bottom straight, that would be of oak. And in fact, the whole boat was uh, timbered in oak and planked in oak. And look at the size of those timbers there. The reason being that the weight of the iron billets was on the top deck. It wasn't held in the hold. Uh, so there's a lot of outward thrust onto that. They needed very, very strong timbers. Uncle Frank turned up to help again. I don't know whether he came from Canada or wherever to help, but he just kept appearing. And there's the side slip of that, well, one of the Wolverhampton Corrugated Iron Company floats that we built. Uncle Frank proudly in the stern, and you can see he's standing on the flat deck that is a float. And his speciality was actually making rudders and tillers for boats. He was particularly skilled with a spoke shave making those. Again, a good example, you can see the flat deck. Much easier to manoeuvre and handle steel billets on a flat deck than having to manhandle them into a hold to get them in and out. And she was towed by a diesel tug that had a 4L2 Gardner engine made in Patrycroft near here in Manchester. I love this because it, it's a false funnel. You have to take the top half of the funnel off so it can get under the canal bridges. But that would tow these boats down to uh, Ellesmere Port and across the Mersey to Liverpool to bring the billets in that were imported from Belgium and from South Wales. We engaged in the world war effort in World War II. We built admiralty cutters. They were mainly for ferrying people around. And what I find fascinating is that not only was JJ in Canada building fair miles for the Royal Canadian Navy, they were building identical admiralty cutters. These are the admiralty cutters constructed in Chester, just outside the graving dock. Here are the Admiralty Cutters, constructed by JJ in Toronto. Yeah, I have 12 hours of DVD footage from Ontario Archives that I'm still trying to edit. That of of, DV, of original cine film that was taken at JJ's yard in Toronto, a monumental task. But I managed to extricate that to show you this evening. But there's the Admiralty Cutters on the canal, perhaps not as sort of uh, clean an area as Toronto Bay, but there we are. HMS Eagle was severely damaged, looks almost like a floating colander to me. Um, and we were commissioned at Taylors in Chester to build lifeboats, replacement lifeboats for HMS Eagle. From 1919 onwards here in Chester, we cornered the market for deep salmon fishing boats. My auntie Edna married a chap, Arthur Howard, so he became my uncle Arthur, and he was a... a talented, talented boat builder, and actually was very much responsible for building the D salmon fishing boats. Here he is building one which was named after him, the Arthur of Chester. There were large planks on oak frames. And we built a range of these. Um, the Nancy of Flint is in the Cardiff Maritime Museum. The Margaret of Chester, top left, is actually in the Liverpool Maritime Museum. 
And there's my Uncle Arthur and my Auntie Edna at the launch of one of the boats. We were also commissioned by the Grosvenor Estates um, to build Tamara of Chester. She was named after the birth of the Duke of Westland. Now the late Duke, we've got a new Duke, Hugh. I think it's getting married this year in Chester Cathedral. Anyway, we were commissioned to build a, a boat and named Tamara of Chester, a deep salmon fishing boat. She was launched in 1983 with a glass of sherry over the bow, which was rather sweet. The sherry as well as the episode. Everything was made in Chester and unusually, we were asked to not paint it in the sort of battleship gray that we tended to paint de salmon fishing boats. Uh, it was left in varnish so one could see the details of construction. And tailors left their mark in Chester by building post-war canal cruisers, rather similar to JJ's Challenger series. So we didn't build grubby little boats. We built a range of canal cruisers mahogany planks on oak timbers. Amaryllis top left is now on at the National Waterways Museum in Ellesmere Port. Some of the boats I'm afraid have been lost, but some are now well restored and are, so, are found somewhere on the canal system. We built fine yachts in Chester. There's Nicola, 33 foot motor yacht with the launch party with my dad, Horace, my uncle, Wilf, the two brothers and the workforce, my auntie Edna there. So the family are still there at the launch. I thought it was very decadent. They had beer and uh, chicken legs afterwards. Very decadent celebration. There she is on the Menai Straits. Motor launches. Mr. Geeson was a director of Seba Geige. I used to love playing at the boatyard. It was my playground. The same boat off the west coast of Anglesey. And our family involvement finished with the death of my uncle Arthur in 1987. Since 2010, the yard's been operated by tenants, Pete and Yvette Askey. It is still running as Taylor's Boatyard and, of course, will be Taylor's Boatyard for perpetuity. I hope I've given you some insight. It's not easy talking to a screen when you haven't got an audience or the audience is out there. I hope you've been very patient with me. Thank you for listening. And I look forward to any questions you might like to ask or comments you want to make. Thank you. Thank you. Jeff, could you unshare your screen then, Jeff, please? Thank you. Um, uh, I'm sure there'll be some messages coming. Uh, uh, there is one which I'll just kick off and then hand over to Ward because it came right at the start, but I think it's been opened, uh, answered. What is oakum? What is oakum? Oakum is old rope, which is then teased out into shreds. Every little thread is teased out. So it's quite a job. If you if you take a piece of hemp rope now and try and untangle it into its individual shred uh, threads, it's quite a job. And so it's picked and shredded, and then it's mixed with linseed oil and tar. Um, and then, ironically, we roll it back into a tiny rope to tamp it into the seams. It was also used for stuffing mattresses. It is said that money for old rope comes from oakum that was used for, was picked and stuffed into mattresses. So it's teased out rope, shredded rope, then mixed with tar, linseed oil, then in boating terms, rolled back into a, a tiny little sort of rope, rather like used to see men rolling their own cigarettes, but this would be a long sort of rolled cigarette. And then that would be knocked with a, 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 a delta shaped chisel into the seam to provide a seal, a flexible seal, and then tar would be placed on top of it. I hope that's answered that question. Thank you. Ward, I'll hand over to you. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks very much, Jeff. Great. Fascinating. Uh, one question and one comment. Uh, the question, why didn't you follow in the family business? Index link pension. Um, I mean, it, that's a fair question. Um, 
I was I I, I went in higher education. It was as simple as that. It, it just it wasn't for me romantically. Yes, I'd like to be a boat builder. I spent my formative years playing there when my mates were kicking around footballs and what have we. I would go to the yard and immerse myself in the smells, the sights, the sounds of the yard. I used to listen to the men yarning round the coke stove in the winter, you know, puffing on their wood vines. And I learned a lot of vernacular at that point as well. Um, it just wasn't for me. It wasn't for me. I, I, I had a yearning anyway, eventually, to become a teacher. And, um, and that's what I did. And, and I've never looked back. I, I still enjoy, by the way, working with young people. Uh, I, I'm a, now an education volunteer at the Chester Cathedral, for example, um, and, and work with young people in the scout movement still. Um, so it, it just wasn't for me. It's as simple as that. I think you're part of a generation that uh, broke the mould because a lot of pe when people started to go to university, they yeah. they branched out. Yeah. Uh, the comment from George about the fact that um, uh, a lot of oakum was uh, was 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 made in the workhouses as well, uh, and you put that picture up. So and then. Um, Many thanks for a wonderful talk. Very informative and definitely one I will need to follow up, says John Ashby. So uh, you've inspired somebody to uh, to do a bit of uh, exploration. Uh, now let's see. Here we come. Uh, Emma Pursehouse says, what a brilliant talk. Amanda, brilliant, interesting talk. Thank you. Ned Williams, very good talk. Much enjoyed. What great photos. And yeah, I mean, you were very fortunate. It seems that the family have kept a lot of uh, photographs that go back quite a way. Yeah, I can just answer that. Uncle Frank had a, a half plate and my Uncle Wilf had a Beck quarter plate camera. Can I, get, is it all right to confess in front of everybody? <laughs> You've got two clergymen looking after you at the moment. Lovely, so, right. Well, uh... I'll, I, as long as I get absolution at the end. Um, <laughs> We had a, a worker at the yard, a chap called Les Cook, whose father was a photographer. He used to lug around this big mahogany camera. However, back to Uncle Frank. Uncle Frank had a half, had a half plate camera and the plates were stored at the yard. Les Cook wanted to make a greenhouse. And he showed me with a bucket of cut water and a razor blade how to scrape the emulsion off the half plates. Now, as a 10 year old child, I got great delight seeing this emulsion scraping off the half plates, which he then carried home and made into his greenhouse. So I have I'm responsible for destroying hundreds of good quality slides of the boat yard and boat building. Fortunately, my uncle Wilf's Beck plate camera, a quarter plate, only became available when Uncle Wilf died in 1961. Well, okay, I was uh, 18 at that time. And so I had a, a greater idea and sense of value. So I managed to keep the plates. A few of the pictures you've seen today are ones that I've copied off Uncle Wilf's plates. But yeah, I destroyed a lot of evidence, I'm afraid. The innocence of childhood. I know. I enjoyed <laughs> it at the time. Yeah. Uh, Val Whiteman says, thank you for a brilliant talk. And Ned Williams chipped back in again, saying, uh, having enjoyed the, uh, the, the the talk, that his grandfather, William, uh, was a boat builder. In the, in, in, in that area? In, Ch in With Chester Connections. I was served, in a, served an apprenticeship in Birkenhead, I think, says, uh, says Ned. Any connections that you're aware of? With other I'm, boat builders up there? Not, not, not particularly. I mean, yeah. as, again, as a kid, that lots were at the yard. In fact, river boats came to the yard for winter brokerage. But, I mean, you didn't know the names of these guys or they'd have nicknames. Or, um, they, they were just this mob of unruly men used to come uh, and chat and natter uh, and generally swear and what have we. It, it, it was just a great experience, but I didn't know them in that sense, no. Another world. Yeah, it was. A number of people have uh, have left the group now, but um, that's the last of the questions that I've got, um, oh, Chris. Okay, thanks. Uh, can I just yeah. ask one? Uh, uh, were your, um, was your uncle, uh, the uh, smuggler, ever caught? Did Sorry. he the court um, when he was transporting liquor across the... No, he wasn't. No. Um, US. In fact, 
I, I've been back and two to Canada many, many times. Um, and on one occasion, I was staying with a, another Taylor relation and the phone went and um, she came to me and said, Jeff, it, it's Dorothy. That's Dorothy Ada Taylor. So it's Dorothy for you. Yes. She said, don't you go telling anybody about how we made money out of prohibition. Yeah. So so they, they got away with it. Um, yeah, they got away with okay. it. Thanks. Thanks, Jeff. And my thanks to add to Wards for a wonderful talk. Thank you. Uh, okay. Emma has just asked, what's the artwork behind you? I presume your your screen. Oh, yeah, that's that. That's uh, an artist, uh, uh, a guy came down and sketched the boatyard. So that is that is actually the boatyard as it is. Yeah. OK. Uh, what you can see there, you can see the cupola to the left on the shed. That that cupola is actually the vent for the sawmill. So there was a, a circular saw in, in that mill. And the chimney at the back was the chimney for the steam engine that ran the line shafts within that sawmill. Lovely, thank you. 